Welcome everyone to this penultimate session of the um, Equality Shakespeare Festival run by the Shakespeare Institute and the Shakespeare Beyond Borders Alliance. It's a great pleasure to be able to welcome back to the festival since they were here at the very start, Paul Edmondson and Stanley Wells, uh, and behind them, a portrait of Nicholas Rowe, I think. Uh, they're gonna be speaking to us about Shakespeare and bisexuality. And that's gonna be taking off from uh, their recent edition of the sonnets, All the Sonnets of Shakespeare, uh, which came out in 2020 with Cambridge University Press. And I'll just read the, the blurb uh, on, on the back of the book, on the back of the, the dust jacket, which gives you a, just a, a brief sense of, of what's so revolutionary about this volume. Intended for all readers of Shakespeare, this beautiful and groundbreaking book arranges Shakespeare's sonnets printed in 1609 in chronological order and intersperses the sonnets from the plays among them. A lively introduction provides a central background while explanatory notes and modern English paraphrases illuminate the sonnet's meanings. I think Paul and Stanley probably require no or very little introduction, uh, but I do remember them being described on Twitter recently as rock stars of the Shakespearean world. So we, we have with us the, the Keith Richards and Mick Jagger of Shakespeare <laughs> studies. I, I leave all of you in the audience to study their visages and work out which is which, but it's my great pleasure to turn over to them for about 40 minutes. They're going to speak to us and then there'll be time for, for questions and comments. So please do use either the chat or the Q&A boxes at the bottom of your screen. Over to you, Paul and Stanley. Thank Thanks, you, Robert, Robert, very much indeed. Um, Stanley, do you want to start as well? Yeah, off? most of Shakespeare's sonnets were written at a time when the form was very popular. There was a big sonnet boom between 1591 and 1597, during which uh, 17 sequences appeared. But Shakespeare's weren't published as a collection until 1609, at least 10 years after that, this fashion had passed. We use the term collection because Shakespeare is not writing a sequence of sonnets, unlike his contemporaries. All their sequences, except for one by Richard Barnfield, which is addressed to a man, all the other sequences are addressed to a woman. None of them are bisexual in their tone or their interests. Two of the exceptional features of Shakespeare's collection are its bisexuality and its original, indeed its audacious presentation of sexuality more generally. Shakespeare made himself the master of the sonnet form. He made it his own. 154 of his sonnets were published in 1609. The latest scholarship suggests that he wrote sonnets over a long period of time, perhaps as much as 30 years or so. And when looked at closely, they show Shakespeare to be addressing many different people and using the form for all sorts of purposes and occasions. 123 sonnets are directed towards individuals. Two of them appear to be sonnet letters. Sonnet 26, was, a, was written to accompany another unidentified literary work. Sonnet 77 accompanied the gift of an almanac. Six sonnets are addressed to abstract concepts, to love, to time, to the poetic muse, and to his own soul. 25 present themselves as meditations, musings on various themes, for, examples, for example, the world's wrongs, absence, mutability, the freedom to love, and the nature of poetry, and reflections on personal feelings, rather like miniature soliloquies, for example, on the nature of lust. 34 of the sonnets form pairs, or perhaps we might say that on 17 occasions, Shakespeare decided to write a sequel to a sonnet, or a double sonnet. It's possible to identify 14 mini sequences among the 1609 collection, made up of three or more thematically related sonnets, for example, on loyalty, grief and memory, and the power of eyesight. In noticing these pairs, mini sequences and multiple addressees, it becomes clear how Shakespeare's sonnets do not form a sequence. They have many different purposes and points of focus. But within this anthology, we do find intermittent revelations of a bisexual personality. To say more about this, we need to be clear about how we can identify Shakespeare's own personality within the 1609 collection. We shouldn't expect all of the sonnets to be intimate revelations about Shakespeare's personality, although some of them are. 
For example, what we call the will sonnets, that is sonnets 136 onwards, 136 ends with my name is Will. Other will sonnets are 22, 57, 89, 134 and 135, and 143. Will is the only non-classical personal name in the entire collection, and the only other two personal names are classical, Adonis and Helen in Sonnet 53. So that really puts Shakespeare's name within the sonnets, which should give us reason to pause and think, ah, oh, these might be personal in some way. The fact that some of the sonnets are difficult to understand, and some are indeed cryptic, suggests that they were written for a private audience rather than from a general one. For example, sonnets 39, 83 and 86. This bears out the earliest reference to Shakespeare as a writer of sonnets when, in 1598, the literary chronicler Francis Mears referred in passing to Shakespeare's sugared sonnets among his private friends. He might be one of Shakespeare's private friends, um, Francis Mears himself, or um, maybe Mr. W Mr. the famous Mr. W.H. the dedication to the sonnets might be one of these private friends mentioned by Mears in 1598. Some of the sonnets are very frank about sex, which suggests that they are intimate and private poems. For example, sonnet 129, which is about the feelings of lust, and 151, in which the poet actually describes having a sexual erection. There are three love triangles in the collection which suggest intimacy and privacy, which seem confessional. Sonnets 40, 41 and 42 are about the poet, another man and a woman. They're addressed to a man. Sonnets 133 and 134 are not revealing about the gender of their addressee or about which genders they might relate to, this love triangle. Um, it could be male, two females, or open to the possible possibility, there could be th about three males. And Sonnet 144, which immediately illustrates Shakespeare's bisexual personality, it's about his famous two loves of comfort and despair. We'll say more about these sonnets soon. But what's become even more, ever more clear to us while we've worked on these poems over the last 20 years or so is that once you jettison the critical baggage that's accrued around them for two and a half centuries since the time of Edmund Malone in the, in the late 18th century, what's become clear is that they tell a story of only two... Uh, the, 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 the myth has been that they tell a story of only two subjects, a so-called fair youth and a dark lady. But the sexuality of Shakespeare's sonnets becomes more personal and more deeply revelatory of a complex personality if one thinks of them differently. We believe this personality, which we, when, we, when we can especially notice it, to be a bisexual one. And we believe, therefore, that Shakespeare's collection of sonnets can be regarded as the seminal bisexual text in English these poems seem to be intimately revealing of their author's bisexuality. Undeniable and the undeniable potency of their sexuality flashes across them. To expand on some of the points we've just made, Shakespeare's sonnets are much more frank about sex than any others in the period. In Sonnet 135, we read, Wilt thou whose will is large and spacious not once vouchsafe to hide my will in thine. Will, as well as being an abbreviated form of the poet's own name, William, could also allude to both the male and female sexual organs, as well as to sexual passion in general. Or consider for a moment this sexual episode in Sonnet 151, which um, Stanley mentioned a moment ago, the, the erection sonnet. Flesh days no farther reason but rising at thy name doth point out thee as his triumphant prize. Proud of this pride, he is contented thy poor drudge to be, to stand in thy affairs, fall by thy side. This rising at thy name 
is felt at the turning point of the sonnet at line nine, known as the Volta. Both of these sexy moments occur in sonnets which are definitely addressed to female subjects. There are as few as 10 of these in all out of 154. But Shakespeare's collection also includes sonnets of love and erotic attention, which he addresses to men. When we read his sonnets carefully and closely, we find that some, perhaps as many as 27 of them, are addressed to male subjects. Some of these, 1 to 17, set out to persuade young men, or perhaps just one man, to beget children. There's nothing particularly unusual about this, except that these sonnets combine a formal register with an overly familiar personal one. In writing them, Shakespeare is in part using terms and images deriving from Erasmus's epistle to persuade a young man to marriage, but the familiar, even risky tone that Shakespeare brings to his project shows that he's captivated by male beauty and by male sexuality. For example, in describing the man's appearance, he uses words like loveliness and beauteous in sonnets 4 and 10. Sonnet 10 also includes the line, Make thee another self for love of me. And in sonnet 13, he refers to the male addressee as dear my love. In sonnet 17, he refers to the heavenly touches that he perceives in the man's face. While Shakespeare criticises the man for not begetting children, he mentions the man's bud. Within thine own bud, buriest thy content. That's in the first of the sonnets. And bud here refers to the beauty that the man is holding within himself, rather like letting his bud burst into flower and fruit. But bud also alludes to the tip of the penis, a bodily part that Shakespeare wants specifically to think and to write about. In Sonnet 4, Shakespeare accuses the man of self-deception for not being procreative and for masturbating instead, having traffic with thyself alone. Try imagining how those lines would have made the recipient feel if indeed these personally revealing sonnets were ever conveyed to their intended addressee. Sonnet 20 is no less frank. A woman's face with nature's own hand painted, hast thou the master mistress of my passion? A woman's gentle heart, but not acquainted with shifting change, as is false women's fashion. An eye more bright than theirs, less false in rolling, gilding the object whereupon it gazeth. A man in hue, all hues in his controlling, which steals men's eyes, and women's souls amazeth. And for a woman wert thou first created, till nature, as she wrought thee, fell a doting, and by addition me of thee defeated, by adding one thing to my purpose, nothing. But since she pricked thee out for women's pleasure, mine be thy love, and thy love's use, their treasure. An especially flirtatious Shakespeare is writing to an especially flirtatious male subject, whom he admires and tries to make resistible. Shakespeare is captivated by the man's eyes, his way of looking, and of gilding the object whereupon it gazeth. He admires the subject's charismatic, manly-looking body, his hue, that is, his bodily figure, a man in hue, all hues in his controlling. Even nature herself, Shakespeare says, fell for this specimen of her own creation, whom nature had originally intended to be a woman. For a woman wert thou first created. But then nature realised that she needed to add a penis to her creature, in order properly to enjoy him for herself, by adding one thing to my purpose, nothing. Whilst Shakespeare claims that his master mistress's thing is no thing to himself, he is unable to stop thinking about it and alludes to it seven times in three lines. 
one thing, no thing, prick thee out, women's pleasure, thy love's use, and treasure. Sonnet 20 crackles with sexuality, with self-knowledge and flirtation, from the male subject's woman's face in the first line to his sexual treasure at the sonnet's conclusion. That telling word, passion, in line two, meaning strong feelings, even suffering, makes the poet's sexuality so impressive and undeniable that any self-restraint arrived at can surely only be temporary. Mine be thy love, he says, a sentiment that seems to arise here primarily out of a fleshly attraction, but one that also points to a deeper emotional reality. If 10 of the 154 sonnets are addressed to women and 27 to men, then up to 86 could be addressed to either a man or a woman. In our edition of the Sonnets of Shakespeare, we've taken pains to identify the gender of the addressee of each poem. If indeed there is an addressee, some of them are, are more like meditations. Most of Shakespeare's sonnets remain open in their directions of desire. The dramatic narratives that have been brought to them and which claim a biographical authority about a fair youth and a dark lady arose out of diffidence, suspicion, prejudice, even fear. These narratives are vivid but fictional. They demonstrate the admission that if Shakespeare had loved both men and women, then it was better to construct a biographical narrative that only allowed him one of each, and for his love for the man to remain unrequited, and his love for the mistress to rack him with guilt. When such narratives are applied to Shakespeare's sonnets, they serve to strengthen the actual living reality that Shakespeare remained married and had three children. In her groundbreaking book, Vice Versa, Bisexuality and the Eroticism of Everyday Life, 1995, Harvard University professor Marjorie Garber shows how the history of criticism of the sonnets has tended to ignore their bisexuality, or at least to play it down. Instead, she notices how, by the end of the 20th century, the sonnets had become more defiantly gay in their resonance, due to a succession of gay-focused studies of the poems and of the Renaissance period in general. Garber's discussion highlights the radical nature of bisexuality itself, radical because it is, in her words, discontinuous, and therefore confounds the very category of identity. She concludes, perhaps regretfully, that a bisexual Shakespeare fits no one's erotic agenda. 25 years after Garber wrote those words, the truth is much stronger and stranger and sexier. Bisexuality remains little noticed and acknowledged in our culture and often still encounters prejudice. The surprisingly little writing about it, we understand bisexuality to mean that a human being can be truthfully, profoundly and equally attracted to both sexes. This attraction might express itself through a series of, non, of monogamous, heterosexual or gay or lesbian relationships, but the person's experience of being attracted to both sexes remains and leaves open the possibility of an alternative, differently inflected sexual relationship. Not only does Shakespeare address sonnets both to a range of men and women, but as we mentioned earlier, there are three moments within his collection in which he specifically writes about triangular bisexual relationships. Three instances that might or might not be connected. In sonnets 40, 41 and 42, he addresses a shift in a three-way relationship when his male lover takes his mistress away from him. Sonnet 40 begins angrily, take all my loves, my love, yea, take them all, and includes the line, then if for my love thou my love receivest, implying that his love has been betrayed. In Sonnet 41, Shakespeare, in spite of the betrayal, admires the beauty 
of both his male and his female lover. Hers by thy beauty tempting her to thee, thine by thy beauty being false to me. The third sonnet in this bisexual mini-sequence, Sonnet 42, attempts an analysis of the development in the relationship. That thou hast her, it is not all my grief, and yet it may be said I loved her dearly. That she hath thee is of my wailing chief, a loss in love that touches me more nearly. Loving offenders, thus I will excuse ye, thou dost love her because thou knowest I love her, and for my sake even so does she abuse me, suffering my friend for my sake to approve her. If I lose thee, my loss is my love's gain, and losing her, my friend hath found that loss. Both find each other, and I lose both twain, and both for my sake lay on me this cross. But here's the joy, my friend and I are one, a sweet flattery. Then she loves but me alone. Shakespeare here seems to convince, convince himself, though perhaps nobody else, that he's not really been deserted after all, since he is so in love with his male friend, perhaps has had sexual congress with him, my friend and I are one, that his mistress in loving the friend still only really loves Shakespeare. The pair of sonnets 133 and 134 also portray a triangular relationship, but with an important difference. Sonnets 40 to 42 are addressed to a man, whereas sonnets 133 and 134 are about Shakespeare's male lover becoming enslaved to a third party, the party to whom both sonnets are indeed addressed. But they do not make clear whether that third party is a man or a woman. In other words, this particular triangular relationship could involve two men and a woman, or three men. These two sonnets stand out as a distinctive pair. 134 provides a syntactically related sequel, which begins, So, now I have confessed that he is thine. They appear to present a development of the relationship, but in fact they arrive only at further feelings of imprisonment. So 133 ends, For I, being pent in thee, perforce am thine, and all that is in me. The word pent here also carries with it an allusion to sexual penetration, pent or penned in thee, as well as meaning trapped and enthralled by. By the end of 134, all freedom is lost. Him have I lost, thou hast both him and me. He pays the whole, and yet I am not free. Finally, we should like briefly to consider one of the most famous of all bisexual poems, Sonnet 144. Two loves I have of comfort and despair, which like two spirits do suggest to me still. The better angel is a man right fair, the worse a spirit a woman coloured ill. To win me soon to hell, my female evil tempteth my better angel from my side, and would corrupt my saint to be a devil, wooing his purity with her foul pride. And whether that my angel be turned fiend, suspect I may, yet not directly tell, but being both from me, both to each friend, I guess one angel in another's hell. Yet this shall I ne'er know, but live in doubt, till my bad angel fire my good one out. When compared to the other two instances of triangular relationships, this sonnet is distinctive because it's not addressed to anybody. Instead, it is a personal meditation or dramatisation of a triangular relationship with a better angel, who is a man right fair, and a worse a spirit, a woman coloured ill. 
these two protagonists perform so striking a story in this single sonnet that critics have mistakenly allowed both the man right fair and the woman coloured ill to take on the biographical personae of a fair youth and a dark lady and then applied them to the rest of the 1609 collection, blunting the particular edges of the sonnets, making simplistic their myriad complexities. But there need not be any further mention of these two particular lovers outside this one sonnet. In the couplet, Shakespeare imagines his two loves having sex with each other and his mistress giving his male lover venereal disease. I guess one angel in another's hell, yet this shall I ne'er know but live in doubt till my bad angel fire my good one out. Hell was Renaissance slang for vagina. This particular sonnet shows a confessional side to Shakespeare, negotiating his own sexual and romantic feelings, feelings which include both comfort and despair. This sonnet also suggests that Shakespeare's sexuality was fully felt in relationship with both men and women. Shakespeare's special authority and reputation as a writer mean that he's often used as a sounding board or a testing ground for our own concerns and interests. But bisexuality has always been part of the human experience, although it has also been frequently ignored or concealed. In Shakespeare's own time, King James I, a married man with two children, made an impassioned plea to members of his court for his sexual love for his favourite, the young and beautiful Duke of Buckingham, to be acknowledged and accepted, to be given free reign. Shakespeare's sonnets, never before imprinted until 1609, now imprint upon us as never before, an open bisexuality that, like Shakespeare's own creativity, holds within it two perceptions, two truths, at one and the same time. Shakespeare needed his attraction to men and women and thrived on it. It helped to make him who he was. We see this bisexuality playing itself out in his drama, for example, in The Merchant of Venice, Twelfth Night or What You Will as you like it, and the two noble kinsmen, and in his ability to body forth male and female identities and emotions. Samuel Taylor Coleridge identified and praised Shakespeare for his androgynous mind. Virginia Woolf, alluding to Samuel Taylor Coleridge in A Room of One's Own, referred to Shakespeare's man-womanly mind. A fresh engagement with Shakespeare's sonnets suggests that Shakespeare's bisexuality helps us further to account for his genius. And perhaps whenever we like to say that Shakespeare is a genius because he shows us what it means to be human, we might now recognise that part of his genius arises from his being bisexual. The emotional, physical and intellectual range of the bisexual experience makes it perhaps the most challenging and compelling expression of all currently defined sexualities. Shakespeare's bifocal, bisexual appreciation of women and men, his physical and his emotional attraction to them in his imagination and surely we can reasonably assume in his life, continue to make Shakespeare's sonnets one of the most empowering literary texts of all time. Whether we share his bisexual feelings and perspective or not, we can feed on the many expressions of love we find there. And we hope from what we've been saying about Shakespeare's sonnets that they now speak afresh and directly to what it means to be bisexual, to be loving and sexual to people of both sexes, in our own time and culture. Thank you very much for listening.
Thank you very much, Paul and Stanley, Stanley and Paul. That was fascinating. I, I've been scribbling all sorts of questions, but um, I'll, I'll just encourage and, and invite all of the participants to post their own questions into either the chat box or the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. But while we're waiting for those questions to, to, to percolate through, perhaps I could begin by asking, uh, I suppose one of the things that th this edition of the Sonnets does that's um, that's new and that's groundbreaking is to put the sonnets into a, a putative or conjecture chronology, right? That this isn't the 1609 sequence, this is not the 1609 order. These poems are given to us in supposed order of composition. And I wondered if we see Shakespeare becoming more bisexual over time. Do we see his bisexuality changing? Is he becoming more assured in his sexuality? Or perhaps is he retreating from, from his bisexuality over time. It, is there a temporal element to this, I suppose, is what I'm asking? Um, I don't think there is. I think if you were to look at, as it were, um, <laughs> sexual hotspots within the sonnet, then I think that um, you'd find them across the chronology. So, for example, 144, uh, a version of it that we've just read, uh, an earlier version of it, it seems, was printed in, in 1599 in The Passionate Pilgrim, it was significantly interestingly revised. We print both versions in our in our edition, um, but it's still early. That places it quite early in in the putative chronology. Um, Forty to forty two, a sort of midway, and one two six, which is addressed to a lovely boy, um, is is late it, uh, as far as you know. Could have been written up to sixteen o nine. So um, I think no is the answer. I'd say that you would find a bisexual personality across the chronological range so therefore across across all the sonnets of shakespeare as we've as we've as we've printed them um uh which I th it takes a number up to 187 sonnets i think was it 189 yeah, uh, rather than 154 i think it's 189 in our in our book and i suppose another question that arises from the way you presented shakespeare's sonnets in this volume you, you, you've given us sonnets from the plays or near sonnets than the plays um, in this in this volume alongside the 1609 uh, sonnets um, and you did mention these instances of bisexuality in the plays um, and I, I wonder if in the sonnets that you're printing from plays do we see a, a kind of bisexuality in those or does the bisexuality seem to be in some way confined to the 1609 volume well I go on Sunny. I think we have the well, same answer to this it's a very yeah. interesting question I, 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 I don't think I see any in the sonnets from the plays. Do you? No, that was my answer no, too. No. Which, 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 which is, which is, you know, grist to our mill in terms of um, our suggesting that some of these poems in sixteen oh nine are intensely personal. Yes, and that yes. therefore he was using the form, especially when you know writing it non dramatically, uh, to find his own voice to shape his own um, uh, thinking, uh, give articulation to his inner feelings, yeah. um, which, uh, so therefore we, in fact, we don't find, a, I can't think of a single example of the play sonnets, um, which are anything other than heterosexual in nature. No. But of course, there are many bisexual moments within the drama, they're just not in sonnet form. Right, right. Is, is, is there something about sonnet form though, that? That encourages a sort of bisexual imagination. Um, I'm just thinking about the, you know, the ways in which a sonnet is made up of two parts and three parts, right? That you've got octave sestet and you've also got octave sestet couplet, um, and that that seems in some ways to map on to the kind of the double loving that seems to happen all the way through the sonnets and these and these triangles that you were talking about too. I don't know. Is there something about the sonnet as a poetic form that seems to encourage bisexuality? That's a, that's a that's a very energizing question, isn't it? Because you know, let's think about we've got three quatrains and a couplet, so three a triangle, and then a couplet, a kind of baseline on which you know we, it takes you into a different kind of relationship. So so if you think about it as a you know, diagra diagrammatically, um, I think that does sort of work. But but yeah, but on the other hand, there are all those other sonnets in the period where the form is the same but bisexuality is not present so perhaps it's pushing it a bit yeah yes exactly <laughs> but, but the question st is still energizing because if we're if we're, our starting point for asking it is does the form relate to shakespeare's bisexuality then um although other sonnets of the period are not bisexual as shakespeare's are he he you, you could say where well, he found something really attractive in the form and certainly 
certainly he did find the form very attractive because he's writing it Absolutely. all his career. Yeah. Yeah. And our book really demonstrates that. So rather than just thinking about the sonnets as a kind of hived off part of a, com a complete works of Shakespeare that they appeared in 1609 and these are Shakespeare's sonnets, when you, when you break open uh, uh, the, that collection and rearrange it chronologically and put the sonnets from the plays interspersed at the appropriate moments, which is what we've done, you'll find that Shakespeare's writing sonnets beyond 1609, uh, all the way through he's, his life as a writer, this form, is important to him. Uh, uh, and he writes no other personal poems. In, uh, uh, he write, All his personal poems are written in sonnet form. I mean, the narrative po poems, Venus and Dennis, The Rape of Lucrece, uh, and The Lover's Complaint, are not in, in sonnet form. Uh, but it's a sonnet form that he goes to when he's really wanting to explore himself. Um, and I, I suppose I might ask too about the the openness that you found both in bisexuality and in and, and in Shakespeare's expressions and explorations of it. Um, I mean, do we sometimes find in Shakespeare's sonnets almost something a bit more like a pansexuality, that a sexuality that can attach to non-human beings as well? I mean, you, you you gave a sense that desire in Shakespeare is something extraordinarily wide ranging. Um, and I just wonder how wide that range is. I mean, do you get a sense that sometimes Shakespeare or the persona of the sonnets desires neither men nor women, but but some other entity? Well, I'm just thinking of the one of the most famous lines, shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Thou art more lovely and more temperate. So you know, he's, he's sort of in love with the, the summer's day at that point to which he's comparing the beloved. Who incidentally might be male or female. That 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 is a that is definitely one of the open yeah. uh, 80, 83 um, male or female ones. Uh, and, and well, that 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 definitely illustrates what you've just you've just suggested. I'm thinking of other instances when Shakespeare is a, is expressing desire, attraction to um, you know non a non human or a, a particular situation or object. Um, can you think of I any? can't think of it. No, I can't. No, I can't contribute to that. I think I did see a, a hand flick up among the participants, and I'm not sure. It's. I don't think it's there anymore. Um, but if I you do want to, I want to say though that it, it, yeah. it, what I've just the illustration I've just given, and there's another one that pops into my head when he's comparing. Um, he's, he's writing about a jealous love, like a like betwixt a miser and his gold. It's it's always in comparison. I think I can't think of you know, just loving, expressing love for a non-human for its own sake. Mm -hmm. um, and um, your term pansexuality requires, does it, that it, 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 it's a, it can be a non-human love. I, for example, I could say I'm in love with this tree. Yeah, I think so. I think yeah. so. Um, and then I, I, wanted, I wanted to then, if we might think about um, the pronouns, which has been quite a useful way for you of, of, of identifying addressees and, and the way sometimes these poems have sort of non-gendered or ungendered um, points of address. Um, so, so there are we, are we kind of thinking about perhaps a trans Shakespeare, a, a Shakespeare who um, is perhaps less interested in, in, in the gender of the addressee? That I mean, that's a very interesting question, um, and it's a very it's a very complex question even to pose. Um, but it's it, it requires a discussion about trans and bisexuality and how they might be related, if at all. Um, I'm I'd, I'd sort of want to say that the perspective seems male even when the addressee yeah. is not clear whether it's male or female. Right. It, it, so, so if it were, if it were, if it were a trans-natured Shakespeare, wouldn't we suppose that sometimes the voice is female, sometimes the voice is male? I don't know. I don't know how you would start to describe that. Um, or, or unless we're thinking about the gender of the addressee, right? That sometimes it seems the gender of the addressee is unclear. Mm -hmm. now, that might be um, that might be bisexual in the sense that it could either be a man or a woman. And it's just not stipulated in pronouns, say. But could there be also some way in which the gender of the addressee is not important to Shakespeare? That there's some, something else about them that's that's desirable. 
it 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 could it could i mean you'd have to sort of find a, a really good you know an example uh, that you would then close closely read um we've been so rigorous on that haven't we Stanley? Yeah, i yeah. mean because no other edition has done it ever and and it, it's such a valuable thing to do if we're going to start making our conversation about these poems you know more interesting and more accurate <laughs> yeah yeah and my questions are taking a um an increasingly abstract bent, I notice. So um, perhaps, um, perhaps I think there might be a, a, an argument in here. I agree with the thesis Edward Cheney says, and have indeed written about the underratedness of the phenomenon in, in, in Genius Friend, but I don't think it's incompatible with featuring Lord Southampton as per Stanley's old chum, Leslie Rouse. Southampton was both Catholic and bisexual in his youth. Uh, I've written about this in greater detail in the pyramids built up with newer might in the online journal. Egyptiarca. So perhaps perhaps there's a question in there then about um, what we might assume biographically about some of the addressees. Yeah. Uh, in, well, in there is one little clue at least when he begins one of the poems, Lord of My Love, isn't that? Sonnet 26. Uh, Lord, it does, Lord there could, after all, mean the aristocrat whom I love. I, I'm, I, actually, I, I'm quite in favour of Southampton. Yeah, we, we, we both like Henry Risley. We think, we think that... Um, he fits the bill in a number of ways. You know, he he's younger, considerably younger, so he can be thought of as a boy. He's an aristocrat. So some of the poems do sort of look up to the beloved But, it, but when, we, when we say fits the bill, what we mean is not that 126 are all about him or addressing him. No, no, him. no, no. That is not what we mean at all, no, which is no. what most critics have said for centuries it's it's rather that the sonnets which can be identified as being addressed to a male subject some of them might be involving um yeah, uh, henry risley and some of them which are about men not addressed to men uh, could be about henry risley right if we i just think he's a useful and interesting and compelling as sandy just said actual historical subject to have have within the frame of, of uh, have or have his name on the table you know among I, but, but at the same politics. time i should say i don't believe that wh in the dedication is there any indication of that because i think that dedication by thomas thorpe is not a shakespearean dedication and i wouldn't i wouldn't want to associate that no absolutely so so i, I recently developed my own little theory about mr wh which i i shall um tell you now um which is let's okay stan is absolutely right that Obviously, the dedication is not by Shakespeare, by Thomas Thorpe, the publisher. Um, and therefore, who is Mr. W.H.? And because of the phrase only begetter, Mr. W.H. has often been thought of, well, he is the inspirer of these sonnets addressed to a man, thinking 126 sonnets, which is wrong. Um, and or begetter also means procurer of the manuscript right so my theory is it's about both let's make that word begetter work in both directions as words in the period often do which means he's both the begetter of the manuscript and the inspirer ergo mr wh is one of shakespeare's private friends mentioned in 1598 by francis mears so here's how it goes if shakespeare and this is we, we do believe what i'm about to say if Shakespeare did not want the sonnets printed in 1609 because they were too private, and we really believe this, and it's unprovable, but the hunch is that they're such private poems, why would you want revelations of your inmost self put in front of an audience who had lost interest in sonnets 12 years ago kind of thing? It just doesn't ring plausible, plausibly. Um, so Mr. W.H. knows that his still friend, Master William Shakespeare, is still writing sonnets and wonders if he's still got those sonnets that you wrote about me, Will, and, and could I borrow them? Also interested to know whether he can recognise any of their circle within the other sonnets that he knows his friend Shakespeare's been writing. So um, Shakespeare agrees, yeah, well, yeah, OK, I've, I've copied them out and I'm, you know, I'm collected, I've collected them together as far as I have. Um, and you can borrow you can borrow my my manuscript and, and read it and while he has it in his possession one of the inspirers of shakespeare's sonnets mr wh takes it to a print takes it to two scribes and has it copied out which will only take two hours of two lots of hands one afternoon 
returns the manuscript to his friend Shakespeare and then um, takes the scribal copies to the printers thinking these are amazing poems. I know he's never going to get around to having them published. I'll do it for him. And so that means that Mr. W.H. is both the inspirer and the procurer of the manuscript. Right. right. You first heard it here. <laughs> and and Rips, Ripsley slash Southampton does seem a useful way to think through some of these questions, right? And, and thinking of that portrait of Southampton that was thought until the early 2000s to be of a female yeah. aristocrat, right? So, so there might there may be some way in which in which the, these questions of bisexual attraction can be encapsulated in one person yeah. uh, who is who is a, a kind of master mistress. Tom portrait, very very feminine looking. Was was thought to be a woman, as you say. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Sandy means, of course, the Cobb portrait of Southampton. Uh, Southampton yeah. and, and, um, yes, and um, we remember the Sun headline when that portrait burst onto an astonished world, Shakespeare, 2002, a headline in the sun. Did Shakespeare's boyfriend wear lipstick? Oh my goodness, this was all over the, the tabloids. Um, and yes, it's a very compelling image when put alongside Sonnet 20 that we read earlier, the master mistress, because is this image male? Is this image female? Right. And youth is another thing that, that, that gets brought up here, I suppose, in that is there a way in which Shakespeare writing about a, a young person also kind of blurs gender boundaries and distinctions? Um, you know, in, in the, perhaps more in, 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 in the 16th, 17th century than now, there is a sort of gender confusion in youth. Well, it takes uh, towards the boy player. Doesn't right, exactly. exactly. Playing females. Yeah. So I think that was a cultural um, alignment in people's minds that um, boy, boy player, you know, had a, fem a, a femininity um, atmosphere uh, about it, a, 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 fe a female gender uh, uh, backdrop, as it were, about it. Um, so maybe when Shakespeare uses boy in the sonnets, uh, we're thinking of boy players, you know. Yeah. yeah. There's a question in the chat here from Ivan or Ivan. Uh, thank you a lot for the talk. I wonder whether we could find reliable means to understand when in the sonnets concerning bisexuality. Shakespeare acts as himself, Shakespeare, and when when he creates a purely fictional literary persona, is is there some um, rubric by which we could work out when Shakespeare's writing in sort of proper persona and when not? No, and I don't think we should even suppose yeah. that he's writing in a literary persona. Right. Everyone who's ever written a poem ever is writing in a literary persona because why? Because you're trying to do what poets do. So you're some you're, you you can't not have influence of that kind. The 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 project of any poet or any poet I've ever spoken to and 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 rate is to tell the truth mm. and to um, uh, do, do that in a compelling way as possible through language um, and. You know, poetry costs, and poetry's cost is usually personal. Um, so I think I'd want to turn it around and say, how would you, how could you demonstrate he's not being personal um, in in these in these sonnets ever? Um, and it's not to say they're all personal. It just means they're coming. Every poet is writing from a personal energy, a personal space. Um, a comparison is helpful here because if you compare them, for example, to Richard Barnfield's collection, which is in, entirely, you know, um, presented through a classical um, persona, by which I mean mask, because of his terms and his and, and his, his use of proper names and so on, that really does feel literary as well as personal. Whereas Shakespeare's doesn't just his collection doesn't work like that. Right. Right. I and mean, there's another question here. Um, thanks for an interesting talk. I was wondering if you read the sonnets or Shakespeare as bisexual in the sense of being attracted to men and women because because they are men and women or as being attracted to people regardless of gender and this being one understanding of the term pansexual. I mean, so do the sonnets talk about specifically male or female characteristics as attractive, for example? I wonder what you make of that. Well, well, they, well, they will be such a thing. Well, yeah. The will is there in one, three, the six, and other sonnets. Um, I'm thinking of you know, my mistress's eyes are nothing like the sun. Sonnet 130, um, sonnet 138. When my love tells me she is made of truth, I do believe her, though I know she lies. Mm. So this is where we get female characteristics described, but they're definitely addressed. Well, actually, those two are are about a woman, not addressed to a woman. Um, so. 
that that that, that, that I think is helpful in, in in response to that question. Um, I think one of the things that was really revelatory for me in listening to your talk was the way in which you explain the the kind of narrative that's been put onto these poems as being essentially a kind of or is originating essentially from a kind of aversion to bisexuality yeah. um, and, 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 and and kind of affirming uh, looking at it now we so say they're, they're reaffirming heterosexuality right. you know they're, they're being they're present they're sort of begrudgingly admitting yeah, yeah, a yeah. bisexual story but at the same time um it, it's it's not one that's going to make you happy so yeah. so therefore you know we can see oh it's shakespeare and and, and it's somehow safe um What's really curious about that, though, Robin, it's in its serious as well as curious, is that that has been brought into Shakespearean biography mm. for a couple mm -hmm. of centuries now. So it's not that people have thought, how do we read the sonnets biographically? It's that people have thought, how do we take the biographical readings of the sonnets and apply them to Shakespeare's life? And a lot of biography has, has done that. Um, and we hope that what we've demonstrated in our new edition will influence Shakespearean biography, that it won't any more be attractive to read the sonnets in the old way, yeah. because um, it, it just doesn't make sense and it doesn't, it, it, it's not accurate enough in, in, in describing these remarkable poems. It's lazy minded, it, it simplifies them, makes them simplistic, it blunts their edges, far better to read each individual sonnet as an individual poem before you start um, connecting them. And it's also the, the problems there on the title page, Shakespeare's sonnets. And if you if you re, if you open the book and think, oh, it's a sequence, well, then you're going to read it like a sequence. Um, but it never was a sequence, it was never intended to be. Um, and when you uncouple the um, 1609 order um, from its chronology, which critics for years have thought they're not printed in the order in which they were written, uh, then their um, discontinuous um, reality, which is that word that Marjorie Garber used about bisexuality, becomes even more apparent. Yeah, and it, 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 it seems significant, doesn't it, that, that, um, that you know, early readers of Shakespeare, but perhaps even our contemporary readers of Shakespeare, find the bisexuality of the poems more troubling than than their homosexuality say uh, that, that, that also more of a hunt, right it's... also but you know when i when i when we were looking for um writing about bisexuality and we say this in the talk there really isn't very much out there i mean it, it's it, it 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 still attracts a lot of prejudice in our culture and this this is just the kind of conversation why this topic is appropriate for Shakespeare Beyond Borders and the Equality Shakespeare Festival, that uh, um, I have s several bisexual friends, and that they're, they're often you know they're often said oh well people don't really get it they they think oh you're basically closet gay or closet lesbian and you haven't jumped off the fence yet and and this is all absolutely insulting to a bisexual person, mm. and properly to be understood in the way that we said very clearly in our talk that genuinely profoundly truthfully you are attracted to both sexes and that that might express itself for, for 20 or more for a few years or a few months monogamously um, with male or female then you might shift yeah. um, there's a, there's a marvelous memoir that was published about four years ago by Luke Turner mm -hmm. called out of the woods and Luke is bisexual and it's a bisexual memoir and it's 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 mainly about um well it's about Epping Forest um but in his his connections to that special place and its history but he he tells the story of his own um uh, sexual awakening and his bisexual awakening and his bisexuality alongside this um history this cultural reflection on Epping Forest. It's a wonderful memoir. It's called Out of the Woods by Luke Turner. And it's bracing too, isn't it, to think that sometimes the homosexual readings of the poems, poems which have sought to recuperate the homosexual desire of, of the sonnets, may also have contributed to this, that they may also have found bisexuality threatening. Um, there's another question here, I think, or maybe just a comment. The, thank you for this incredible presentation discussion, Lisa Vanko. The old barriers to true human sexuality and gender need to come down. 
I'm also convinced that Shakespeare is bisexual and beautifully so. Beautifully bisexual. Thank you, uh, Lisa, for that comment. That, that, that seems like a, a lovely point on which to wrap up, actually, because um, I know, Paul, you in particular have to leave at, at half past on the dot. Um, mm, yeah. Can, can I just take this opportunity to um, to plug the final session of the uh, of the Equality Shakespeare Festival, which will be happening in about half an hour's time, uh, which is concerned with Shakespeare and ecology uh, and looks brilliant. I'm, I'm very much looking forward to that. Uh, but most of all, to thank Paul Edmondson and Stanley Wells for what, as I say, for me, and I'm sure for many of you, has been a revelatory account of these poems and of the bisexuality that's at the beating heart of them. Thank you very much for joining. Thank um, you. To see Thank you. All. Thank you.